So we're continuing to look at the notion of a vertex algebra. And in this video, we want to look at how to combine two things called vertex operators via this thing called the normally ordered product or sometimes the wick product. So before we do that, I want to recall our definition of a vertex algebra, which we saw in the first video, and then point out some maybe holes in this definition that lead to maybe confusion in the whole setup. So a vertex algebra is a vector superspace, V, which is V0 plus V1. So before we just called it a vector space, well, in fact, a better definition of this would be a vector superspace. And so this is the even part, and then this is the odd part. So everything in V0 is considered an even vector, and everything in V1 is considered an odd vector. And then this vector superspace is endowed with infinitely many products. So if you've got an A and a B inside the vector space V, you can multiply them together infinitely many ways. And we denote that by just putting them next to each other with a subscript on the left one. So in other words, the nth way of multiplying A and B is A subscript NB. And here these n's are inside the integers. So your multiplications are indexed by the integers. And while we're at it, this is something that we'll look at a little bit more closely later. But often, we don't actually think of these things as multiplications or as products. But we think of this a subscript n as being a linear map on the vector space. So notice if you've got some sort of algebraic structure, instead of defining, multi defining multiplication, you can actually define a linear map. So let's see, I've, say I've got the cross product. I wanna do A cross B. Well, instead of doing A cross B, I could define a linear map, which is left cross product by A. And then A cross B happens to be that linear map evaluated at B. So in other words, for any vector A, you've got a linear map which produces A cross whatever you plug into it. Well, the same thing goes here, except you've just got infinitely many of them. So let me reiterate here, You've got two choices of how you want to think about this. A mixture of the two is probably your best bet. You can think of this as being infinitely many ways of taking the product of these two vectors A and B. Or you can think of associating infinitely many linear transformations to the vector A. And then when you evaluate it at B, you get that thing which we're calling the product of A with B, the nth way. Okay, so let's see where we are. We've got a vector superspace, infinitely many products. Then next, we've got two special objects. One of them is an element one, that's often called the vacuum element, and then a map T, and that's often called the translation operator. And they satisfy the following four axioms. So first, if you take 1n, in other words, that linear transformation associated with 1, you get delta minus 1n times the identity operator. So in other words, if you take 1 sub n and you multiply it to a, in other words, if you take the nth multiplication between 1 and a, where 1 is coming from the left, you're going to get delta minus one in A. So in other words, you're gonna get A if N is equal to minus one, and you're gonna get zero every other time. Okay, so that's our first axiom. Our second axiom is called the creation axiom, and that says that if you take the negative first multiplication of A with one, or A with the vacuum, you get A. And then if you take any non-negative multiplication of A with 1, you get 0. So these non-negative multiplications annihilate the vacuum. Okay, next we have this thing called the truncation axiom. And that says for all A and B in V, there exists a natural number. That natural number will depend on A and B. So sometimes it's written as N subscript A, B, but I'm just going to leave that off. Such that... A n b is equal to zero for all little n bigger than n. So in other words, after some point, if you multiply vectors together, you'll only get zero, and that's in that positive product direction. 
So maybe that point is like five. So maybe A5B is zero. Well, that means A6B is zero, A7B is zero, and so on and so forth forever and ever and ever. But before that, you don't have zero, or you don't always have zero at least. So A4 times B is a new vector. A3 times V is also a new vector. A2 times V is another vector, etc. Okay, good. So that's the truncation axiom. And I should say that the truncation axiom is equivalent to this thing involving vertex operators. So if you define this y a z to be the sum as n goes from the integers of a sub n z to the minus n minus one. So notice this is a sum of these like linear combinations with this variable z. Then if you take their commutator, so y a z y b w, and then you hit it with z minus w to the n, you get zero. And this is in fact how we're gonna check this kind of thing with this orange thing right here. That's equivalent to this truncation axiom. Then next, our linear map T called the translation operator obeys the following rule. So T of A is equal to A minus two, one. So in other words, it moves it down from A minus one, one, which is A to A minus two, one. And then next, also, if you take this vertex operator at t of a, z, then that's the same thing as taking the derivative of the original vertex operator. So that's also important. Now, maybe one more thing to point out before we get into what we're gonna talk about with this video is that sometimes this one is written as this bracket zero thing. So I think maybe physicists would be like more familiar with that notation, but I'll just say that, you know, I'll generally use this uh, blackboard bold one, but this kind of shows up sometimes, you know, uh, especially in like uh, the Frankel Benz V book, I think they use this mostly. Okay, so now I wanna recall some things about these products before we get into it. And that is the negative products are generalizing commutative associative algebras. So they're generalizing some commutative associative product. So in other words, a minus one B, a minus two B, a minus three B, and so on and so forth. And then the non-negative products are generalizing the Lie bracket. So in other words, a zero B, that's a generalization of the Lie bracket. A one B is a generalization of the Lie bracket, a two B, and so on and so forth. And these points right here at the end of each of these are closest to the commutative associative product and the Lie product as you get. And then as you move down the line in either direction, you get further generalized. So you're further away from the actual definition of the Lie bracket or the commutative associative algebra. Okay, so this is the proper definition of a vertex algebra, but it really doesn't tell us anything about what they look like or how to do any sort of calculations. So that's something that we need to build up. And so hidden in this definition is our questions like, how do we do things like this? So how do we take the negative third multiplication with B and then take the negative second multiplication of that with C. So notice that's associated in one direction versus doing it in this direction, which we can consider as being associated in this order. So that would be the negative second multiplication of B with C, and then from the left, the negative third multiplication with A. So how do we like think about the difference between those two, and how do, do we define something like this in general? But notice, defining something like this in general, which is like some sort of associative operation involving these multiplications, would involve looking at the vertex operators. And so the big question is, how does this y a sub m b z relate to y a z and y b z? So what I'm talking about here is, notice that this will be the sum of a m b grouped sub n and then z minus n minus one. So hopefully a vertex operator like this is related to the individual vertex operators. And what we'll see is they will be, but we have to tweak it a little bit. And we're not gonna be able to get all the way there in this video.
Okay, so let's maybe clean up the board and start thinking about how we would multiply these vertex operators. If we understand how we can multiply these vertex operators, then we can start to understand things like this, which will be very, very important. So we just got done sketching out some motivation for why we need to think up some sort of multiplication between the vertex operators. And just to reiterate, it was so that we could understand the associativity pr properties of these infinitely many multiplications, a sub n, b, is how we've been writing them. And so what I'm going to start with is just try to straightforward multiply these two vertex operators, y a z, which I will denote of a of z, and then y b z, which I'll denote b z. And here I have a and b are both elements from my vertex operator v. And then, in order to make sense of this in the first place, we need to evaluate this at a third vector, so we'll evaluate it at C. But then, we have some stuff that comes along for free because of the truncation condition. And so I've given those here underlined in red, so we know that A sub N C is equal to zero, and everything after that. So A sub N plus one, A sub N plus two, and all of those evaluated at C will give you zero, or that product is gonna give you zero, and then the N plus first product, and so on and so forth. And then the number for B and C is this capital M. So in other words, B sub M C is equal to zero, and all of the products after that are also equal equal to zero. Okay, great. So like I said, let's just go ahead and try to multiply these and see what goes wrong and see how we can fix that. So let's take a of z, b of z, and then we're going to evaluate this at c. So notice that's going to be the vertex operator yaz, the vertex operator ybz evaluated at c. But let's recall what these are. So the vertex operator yaz is going to be equal to this sum as n goes from all of the integers. So this is a doubly infinite sum. n goes from minus infinity to infinity of a sub n z to the minus n minus 1. Great. And then this next one is going to be the sum m is in the integer, so that's another doubly infinite sum. And we've got b sub m, and then z to the minus m minus 1, and then we need to evaluate that at c. So it's pretty easy to just bring this c inside here and rewrite this guy as b m evaluated at c, and then z to the minus m minus 1. So that's just a formal sum of vectors in our vector space V because we know this is the nth product between B and C. So we know that this is an element from V. But now we need to somehow multiply those two doubly infinite products to make sense of what's happening at every power of Z. So here, I'm just gonna do a couple of examples and then after looking at some examples, it's pretty clear what the structure should be. So let's maybe first look at the constant term. So the constant term will, in other words, be the z to the zero term. So the easiest way to get the z to the zero term will be the constant term here and the constant term here. So the constant term here is going to be a minus 1. The constant term there is b minus 1, and then c. So we've got a minus 1, b minus 1, c. Great. And then we can move upward in that direction and downward in this direction as we move like n bigger and then m smaller or vice versa. So notice we'll also get a constant term if we have an exponent of 1 here and an exponent of negative 1 here. But that's going to be associated to a sub minus 2, b sub 0, c. Great. And now let's maybe give myself a little bit more room so we can take this a little further. Then we can also have a coefficient of z squared here and a coefficient of z to the minus 2 there. So that's going to be plus a sub minus 3, b sub 1, c. Great. But notice we know when that is going to stop because of this truncation condition right here, bmc is equal to zero. So this is gonna stop in this direction at bmc, 
and then let's see what we get for a. So notice that these need to add up to negative two. So this is going to be a sub minus m minus two. So it stops in that direction. Well, that's good. And then, like I said, that's our coefficient of the constant term. So in other words, that's our z to the zero term of this product. Now let's move back in this direction so we can move back in this direction um, in kind of a symmetric way. So here we'll have b sub minus two c and then a sub zero. And next we'll have a sub one, b sub minus three c plus, and you might look up there at the truncation condition of a and say, oh, we're good to go. We know that a n evaluated at c is zero, but notice we're never gonna get a n just evaluated at c. We don't have commutativity here, so we can't just move it past and take a n evaluated at c. As we build up this A, we're gonna build down that B. So the vector that we're plugging in to these products of A are always changing. So we can't use the truncation condition in this direction. So this goes off forever. So I'll put a little infinity there to say that that goes off forever. So in other words, the coefficient of Z to the zero is an infinite sum. So notice this guy right here is an infinite sum, which means this type of product diverges. And it diverges in the algebraic sense. So when we talk about convergence or divergence algebraically, we're talking about having a finite sum or an infinite sum. So maybe I'll say right here, this algebraically diverges. And now we can do something very, very similar for the z to the one term, the z to the two term, the z to the minus one term, and so on and so forth. So maybe I'll just put plus dot, dot, dot. I urge you guys to work out some examples. So maybe let's like write homework here. So work out coefficients of z to the one, z to the minus one, et cetera. And also, after doing that, maybe work out the coefficient of maybe an arbitrary z to the n. Well, maybe n isn't a great choice because we've got n up here, but maybe an arbitrary z to the k. And what we'll see is that we'll have infinite sums for all of those. But to be honest, we only need an infinite sum in one of these coefficients for this thing to algebraically diverge. So we've already seen that this thing algebraically diverges. Okay, so maybe like post in the comments what you guys get for these. I think that would be good. Okay, great. So what's the summary of this um, board? So I would say that the summary of this board is that we cannot just straight up multiply vertex operators in general. There are some very, very special cases when you can just straight up multiply them, but you can't just straight up multiply vertex operators in general. You will get something that algebraically diverges. So maybe let's go ahead and clean this up and then we'll fix this via something called the normally ordered product. So we saw on the last board that we can't just multiply these two vertex operators. Sometimes these are called fields fields willy-nilly because we'll get something that does not algebraically converge. So here we want to fix that a little bit and we're going to fix that with something called the normally ordered product. And I want to point out that this is sometimes called the WIC product. Now before we define the WIC product we need a couple of accessory things. And so those accessory things are going to be pieces of A of Z or this vertex operator Y, A, Z. So what we'll do is we'll split this vertex operator A of Z into two pieces and we'll call those pieces A plus Z. So let's define A plus Z. So that's going to be the sum as N goes from bigger than or equal to zero of a sub n z to the minus n minus one. So in other words, that's all of the negative powers of z. So you can see that because if you plug in n equals zero, you're gonna get z to the minus one. n equals one is z to the minus two and so on and so forth. So we can go ahead and write this out. It's not too bad. We can write this out. It's gonna be a zero z minus one plus a one z minus two plus dot dot dot. So notice it's only singly infinite, which is nicer, I guess. 
Okay, great. Now, the next thing that we want to do is define a minus z. And we're going to define that as, well, I bet you can guess since we just defined a plus in this way. So this is going to be the sum as n goes over all of the negative numbers of a n z to the minus n minus 1. So now we could write that out just like we wrote the one out above. So notice that's going to be a minus 1 plus a minus 2 z plus a minus 3 z squared and so on and so forth. So again, it's singly infinite, but it's singly infinite in the opposite direction. So let's maybe notice here that this completely decomposes our vertex operator a of z. So a of z is equal to a plus z plus a minus z. Great. Now the next thing that we want to do is use this a plus and this a minus to define this thing called the normally ordered product. So that's what we'll define right at the bottom here. And then on the next board, we will check that it's well defined. So we need to say something about the parity of our A and B before we get started with this. So let's just maybe put that over here. So there's this like parity operator, which tells you the parity of an element. So if let's maybe call it an element V so it doesn't look like anything on the board. So, so if V is in V sub I, where I is either zero or one, then we have these like, it looks like absolute values around V, but really that's just saying the parity of V is equal to I. So in other words, if V is even, its parity is zero. And if V is odd, its parity is one. Okay, good. And so remember this thing breaks up into even and odd parts. So this is just a measurement of that. Okay, now let's go ahead and define this normally ordered product. So I define it with these open circles. I even wrote like um, a LaTeX function that allows me to put open circles really, really easily whenever I write papers for stuff like this. But a lot of people just put colons. I don't know, I just like the open circles. I think they're more aesthetic. So here we're gonna define A of Z b of w so we're actually generalizing a little bit we're allowing for two different formal variables just because we can and it'll be useful later so we read this as the normally ordered product of a z b w so let's see what this is going to be so this is going to be equal to a minus z b w so that would be the negative part of a multiplied into b and then plus negative one to the parity of A times the parity of B. And then B, W, A plus Z. So we've changed the order there. That's what we mean by normally ordered product. So we have normally ordered these two vertex operators, sending like all the A plus stuff to the right. That's the important thing here. So like from physics, this is like sending all the annihilation operators to the right or something like that. Um, okay, great. So now what we need to do is check that that is well defined. But maybe before we do that, let's talk a little bit about this parity. So notice if A and B are both odd, then you'll get negative one to the one, which is gonna be negative one, so you get a minus between these. But if either of them are even, then you're just adding things up here. Okay, so I'll maybe move this up and then uh, we'll check that this is well defined. So on the last board, we noticed that we can't just straight multiply two vertex operators because when we did, we got something that we said algebraically diverged. And so, so what I meant by that is that some of the coefficients of some of the powers of the formal variables had infinitely many terms. And so that was a problem. So we came up with this thing called the normally ordered product, or we presented this idea of the normally ordered product or the WIC product. And we presented it with more than one variable. So we had A, Z, B, W. And so that was A minus Z, B, W, and then B, W, A plus Z. But what we really want to check here just for this video is that if we have Z equals W, we get something that's well defined. So in other words, if we take this normally ordered product of A with B, both of the formal variables are Z, then it's OK, where we have this sign changing right here depending on the parity of A and B like we discussed on the last board. 
So what do I mean by well-defined? So that means that if I take this normally ordered product of AZ, BZ, and hit it to a vector C, where that's another vector in the vector space, we should get something that formally algebraically converges. So it will be a formal sum of infinitely many terms, but each coefficient of each power of z will only have finitely many terms in the sum. Okay, and along the way, we're gonna use this fact that a n c is equal to zero and everything after that as well, and b m c is equal to zero and everything after that as well, where those are capital N's and capital N's. So those are the truncation numbers of a with c and b with c. Okay, so let's get to it. So using this definition up here, we need to do a minus z b z evaluated at c plus minus one to the a b and then b z a plus z evaluated at c. So we're just gonna do one of these at a time and actually I'm gonna leave the other one for like a homework exercise. I think that would be maybe good because they go very, very similarly. So we're gonna show that this thing underlined in orange is well-defined from this formal algebraic sense. And then the other term will, again, like I said, be left as an exercise. So notice if we've got this A minus Z and then B, Z, C. So that's gonna be the same thing as the sum as N goes over all of the negative numbers of A sub N, Z to the minus N minus one, times this sum as b, sorry, as m goes over all of the integers, so this is still doubly infinite, of b sub m, and then z to the minus m minus one, and then we need to hit all of that onto c. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. So notice that that's gonna be, well, multiplying that out is non-trivial. So let's maybe look at an example real quick. Let's look at an example of maybe the z to the zero term. So here I'll put a big parenthesis here. And then the z to the zero term, let's see what that is. So first of all, notice that we can change this doubly infinite sum to a singly infinite sum. We only need to go up to m minus one because we know b sub m evaluated at c is zero. So that means everything after that is as well. We're assuming that's our truncation number. So here we've got m equals minus infinity up to m minus one. So here we've got a singly infinite sum times a singly infinite sum. And then from like a real analysis class, uh, it should be pretty familiar that you can write this in a way that is what we called formally algebraically convergent. But let's maybe go ahead and write out some coefficients just to make sure. So in this case, there's gonna be a very first term that gives us that coefficient. And that's gonna be the a sub minus one, b sub minus one times c term. So notice this is gonna go from n equals minus infinity to minus one. So maybe we wanna write that n equals minus infinity to minus one. So that would be like if we're at the minus one spot here. And now we just move down. So the next one is gonna be a sub minus two, b sub zero, c. The next one's gonna be a sub minus three, b sub one, c. All the way up to, notice that's gonna stop somewhere because of our truncation condition. That's gonna stop at a sub minus m, minus one, b sub m minus one times c. So we have a finite number of terms here. So let's maybe write that. So finitely many terms. But now finitely many terms means that this thing algebraically converges. And now we could do something similar for all powers of z. So in general, we're gonna have the following coefficient. So the coefficient of z to the k of a z minus, and then b z c will be equal to the following. So we can take our first term from here, which is a sub minus one, 
That's going to contribute a z to the 0. So that means we need to take the z to the k term from here. But the z from, to the k term from there will be b to the minus k minus 1 times c. And now we'll just build a down while we build k up. So building a down will be a minus 2. And then we have b minus k c. And then let's see where we end up here. So our last non-zero term will be b sub m minus 1 times c. Notice b sub m c is going to be 0, and everything past that is going to be 0 as well. But then what a is going to correspond to that? So we're going to have a sub minus m minus k minus 1. So notice the indices in all of these add up to minus k minus 2, which is like kind of what we want it to. Um, okay, and then maybe the most important thing here is that you have finitely many terms. So let's write that. So finitely many terms, but that means this thing algebraically converges. And so since this thing algebraically converges, um, and this is an arbitrary power of z, then that means all of the powers of z have these finitely many terms as coefficients, which means this whole thing right here algebraically converges. So maybe we should underline this in orange so it goes with that one up there. And now maybe as homework, homework, check this is also okay. So by OK, what I mean is that this also algebraically converges in the same way. And then finally, it might be nice to put all of these together into one thing. Notice we essentially have this first part put together in this because we can write this guy right here as just the sum as k goes in the integers of the coefficient of z sub k in this thing and then z to the k. And we calculated that coefficient above. So maybe you could put that together into one piece, but it's not super necessary. OK, so we've come up with something that looks almost like a product of two vertex operators called this normally ordered product or this WIC product. And this is something that we'll use in order to explore this internal structure for vertex algebras. And that's a good place to stop.